Earth is filled with energy, and we're just scratching the surface on ways to harness it. Creating more efficient ways to power our lives can help solve so many problems around the world. It's why I'm so passionate about exploring the possibilities of geothermal energy. Using this power source, we can transform the way we live day to day, producing clean energy from places we never thought possible. So, I'm... I'm here to talk about energy, and in preparing for this talk, I watched every single TED talk I could on energy. Not only where it said energy, where it said alternatives, and where it said all of the individual ones. All 10 hours, 40 minutes, and 39 seconds, which my wife's in the audience, thank you for dealing with all that. I learned a whole bunch of great things. I learned that there was so much innovation going on in the field of energy that it was really mind-blowing. Tons of out-of-the-box thinking, but I also came across a very important question. Really? Are you sure you want to talk about energy? Now, I'm a huge fan of TED Talks. I try to watch one almost every day, and no offense to energy, but it's kind of where TED Talks go to die. <laughs> Which is bizarre to me, because energy is so relevant. We use it in every aspect of our lives. It changes our food prices, the prices of clothing, the prices at the pump. Everything has to do with energy. But why isn't it not relevant? And then it came to me, okay, it's using energy is relevant, but producing it and our plan for energy, no. It's too complex. The technology is changing too fast. This occurred to me, if I come out with a talk and I say, well, it's going to be this, all right, well, maybe tomorrow someone else will come along and everything that I say could be worthless tomorrow. So we don't have a f clue what the future holds. We really don't as far as energy. Technology is just moving that way. Something new could happen tomorrow. So I thought, you know what, I surrender. <laughs> I, uh, forget about it, yeah, okay, that's fine, I'm back. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, and it's really weird because sometimes, you know, the, the serendipitous moments of life just happen. And in the process of saying, all right, I gotta figure out a new TED Talk, I picked up this book that I liked as a kid uh, Shell Silverstein's Where the Sidewalk Ends, and it, it actually convinced me of not only why I should talk about energy, but why I need to talk about energy. In this poem, Where the Sidewalk Ends, and I recommend you all read it, it talks about one world and two perspectives that you have to see that same world. One that focuses on problems, and one that focuses on possibilities. Now, I believe in a green energy future. I believe that economic prosperity and environmental responsibility can go hand in hand. And I believe that no matter what dire consequences present themselves, that we can make it. We are arguably the most adaptive species on the planet. We can make it through everything. We've already survived climate change. We've already survived spills, thrills, bombs, wars, even megafauna. Sabertooths are scary. Even 80s hairstyles. <laughs> scary. And how did we survive all this? We looked in the mirror. Know thyself, right? Looked in the mirror and said, ugh, fix that. So who are we? And most importantly, where are we on our path towards that green energy future? So currently, the U.S. actually ranks second in total energy consumption and fourth in total energy consumption per capita, which, hey, we're not the biggest energy hogs, which is something we hear all the time, but we are roughly 5% of the pop world's population using about 20% of the world's energy. So in other words, the average American consumes about five times more energy than the global average. 
This is where most of our energy sources come from. And actually, in preparing for this talk, I asked a lot of people, so hey, where do you, what, what do you think our energy sources look like? And I was shocked to find how few people actually had something even close to, to this. You know, and this is more than just where we get our energy. This is also where is our economy going. So this shows us some really important things that are going to be important for this talk. We see natural gas, coal, and petroleum really dominating the energy mix-up. And it's not only in energy, but it's also the industries behind it, the 100 years of infrastructure that's gone into all of this. So in light of making a change, we need to take this into, into account. And we need to see that there are three paths that we are going to have to take. We need to be, have, have more energy efficiency, conservation, greener cars, greener buildings, the works. Greener transportation fuels is a huge part. And then what really impassions me, greener electrical generation. Energy is a very complex problem. And there is no way that I'll be able to address every single aspect of it in the, in the next few minutes. So go look for yourself. It's a big part of it. But here are some things to consider on the path. Number one, if we want to make a difference, if you're serious about making a difference in the way that we use and produce energy, here's the rule. One, may the cheapest energy source win. Energy is the basis of our, our economy. As a result, energy prices affect everything. So we need to find a cheap solution first. Number two, there's this notion that fossil fuels are just going to, you know, give up their market share. Okay, you can have it. We're done here. It will be, you can go be green. That's really unlikely. I, honestly, sometimes what people say is utterly absurd about it. These industries employ millions and millions of Americans. These industries are a big part of our infrastructure. And if we want to make a change, we've got to be prepared for the social, the economic, and the politi political impacts of this. And most importantly, in the future, <laughs> we have no idea what our energy mix up's going to be. And if we do, it could change tomorrow. That's how quickly technology is advancing. In fact, one thing that you hear again and again is we've come out with more technology than we've been able to adapt. But for now, everyone seems to be saying that natural gas, OK, that's the next step, right? And that's great. You know, There's a lot of pros. It's cheap. It's abundant. It's American. It uses the same tools, technology, and infrastructure. So it hacks the oil and gas, the oil industry. And it burns cleaner than other fossil fuels. Cons as far as the green energy future, it is still a fossil fuel. And it's so cheap that it's making other energy sources really, really well, difficult to get off the ground. So is this a detour? A lot of people seem to say it is, but I, I disagree. So in all of these talks, in all of these green energy solutions presented, I found lots of out-of-the-box thinking. And I think there's another way to look at this problem. But to do that, we're going to have to revisit the box. You guys got the background. You guys got the background of this. So it's not just a box. This is a multi-dimensional fossil fuel industry dominated complex box. So it's really a cube, right? So looking forward, my number one message here is don't trash the box. Hack the cube. And this is where geothermal energy comes in. It's what I'm passionate about. And here, I want to let you know why. There's two types. There's passive geothermal systems. These conserve energy. So think megawatts, the negative watts, the energy you are not using because you're saving it, blah, 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 you get it. And active. Active geothermal produces energy. These are the megawatts, what power cities and turns your lights on. As far as passive geothermal, again, it does not produce electricity. But it does help lower your electric use by using what's available in the Earth. And examples of these are the ground source heat pumps, so the geothermal air conditioning units that a lot of people have in their homes, or using a hot spring. You know, you can just sit in there. You don't have to heat up any water. Then there's active geothermal, and this is what fires me up. This generates electricity from the Earth's heat. Earth's heat. Hmm. Well, as you go down into the Earth, you'll find that the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. When you get to the center of the Earth, the temperatures are similar to the, sem the temperatures of the surface of the sun on our planet. Now, 
The sources of this heat come from two main areas, natural radioactivity deep in the Earth, and then also remnant heat from the Earth's formation. Basically, roughly 4.5 billion years ago, two bodies were doing circles around the sun and bam, smashed into each other. The heat, the power, the intensity of that collision was so much that it melted, at least partially, giving us the Earth that we're standing on today, and the moon, actually. It used to be all one big mess. But that heat, four billion years ago, is still with us today. And it will continue to be with us for a long, long time. Earth is hot. So no matter what we do, there's nothing we can do to change that. The Earth will continue to be hot. In fact, geothermal energy here on Earth, well, it's going to last for such a long time that before we worry about it running out, we have to worry about the sun going red giant. Because the sun is a, well, adolescent, so the sun's going through puberty right now, pretty much. It's going to expand in about 7 billion years, engulf the Earth, and, well, we'll have to find another planet to live on. we got time, though. <laughs> so what's fascinating about this is geothermal is constantly there. It doesn't depend on the sun shining, the wind blowing, uh, OPEC deciding we're not friends anymore or a plague wiping out your bio, biofuel crop. This resource is always on. It's 24-7, and it's right under our feet. How's energy made? I'm, it, basically like this. You have a heat source right here. It boils. We're going to call this one water just to keep it simple, but there's a fluid. So here's our boiler. The, ener the fluid turns to vapor, goes through, powers turbines, which powers a generator, which gives you electrical production. And then you condense it all to keep it a closed system, sustainable and all that. Except you're burning stuff over here. Geothermal doesn't burn anything. Geothermal is heat that's in the earth, and you're just harnessing it. So your boiler and your heat source are one and the same, which is fascinating, because once your plant's set up, you do not need a fuel source. You are free of a lot of fluctuations associated with energy costs and your fuel source. So tapping the Earth's heat, we look for geothermal reservoirs. So think a mix of hot water, pure steam, could be both, deep in the Earth. Think of a hot spring. You know, you have your geothermal reservoir down here. Hot water flows up a fault. So think the Earth's natural plumbing system, right? And it gives you your hot spring and your little pigs hanging out in there, right? A geothermal power plant works in a similar way, only that we create our own plumbing system. In this case, we drill a well. Very, very, very similar to one of an oil and gas well. We produce, the hot, oops, we produce the hot water, we pass it through a power plant producing energy, and then take all of that and re-inject it. The earth reheats it, and the system becomes a closed loop. It becomes sustainable. It becomes long-term. And an extra perk. This is actually Iceland's biggest tourist attraction. It's called the Blue Lagoon. When they're done with these waters, you don't immediately have to put them back. So you might notice there's a geothermal power plant on one side <laughs> and a fancy spa on the other. <laughs> so what's great about geothermal? In my opinion, the biggest advantage, radiant skin. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, that's the second biggest advantage. In my opinion, geothermal's biggest advantage, and this is what gets me fired up about it, is it's a hack. Geothermal repurposes the same tools, technology, drill rigs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as the oil and gas industry, as in the big player in our energy market. Only it does so to produce green energy. In fact, the world's largest producer of geothermal energy is a little company you might know, Chevron. Geothermal geothermal is currently produced in 24 countries around the world, and the U.S. is the largest producer. So at SMU, so at the SMU Geothermal Lab, Google actually came to us and said, hey, we're interested in this. How, how much energy can the US produce geothermal-wise? Isn't it only associated with volcanoes? Well, we hacked the system. We saw it wasn't a box. We saw it was a cube, and we hacked the cube. These are oil and gas wells with data. We found new ways to use that data and created this, the geothermal map of, of the US. And you see here. Red, highest grade, blue, lowest grade. We're not doing too shabby in here, by the way. No volcanoes around, right? But how much is the US's potential? So as far as putting power plants, we estimate 
that we've got about 3 million megawatts worth of potential geothermal capacity. To put this in perspective, right now, the US uses about a million megawatts. So it's simple math. With the existing, existing, as in today, Cedris Parbus, all that stuff, technology, tools, et cetera, et cetera, we could power the US three times over with geothermal energy. Now, all of this, don't take it from me, download it. You can find it on google.org backslash EGS. We've got a nice little layer on there, and you can even click on your state and see how much power is available. And notice, these are not crazy estimates like you hear with a lot of renewables that, yeah, you can power the world a billion times over because it's assuming perfect efficiency. We're not assuming perfect efficiency. We're assuming reasonable efficiencies, even if we have 2%, 14%, or 20% recoveries. So it's not 100% recovery and we're still getting these really promising numbers. But what's this all mean for Texas? Well, we're built on energy. Not only does it provide a major portion of our economy, in North Texas especially, it saved us from a lot of the really negative impacts of the recession, but it also adds for great TV. <laughs> I mean, JR just would not cut it in retail. I'm sorry, <laughs> it wouldn't work. We're also sitting on top of the Barnett Shale here in North Texas. It's had a tremendous economic impact. It represents about a little over 7% of all the natural gas produced daily in the United States. It's given us a lot of jobs. And also, it's drilled a lot of wells. So let's hack the system. This will end one day. It's not a renewable resource. Natural gas will end. It may be the next step. but. Are we just going to pass our problems again to the next generation? As a current young generation, I don't appreciate it, older generations who pass the problems along, by the way, just saying. Um, it's going to end. So what do we do? Let's hack the cube. Let's notice that there are over 18,800 wells drilled here in the Barnett Shale, each one giving us a solid data point to understand our geothermal resources, each one highlighting that right underneath the Barnett Shale there's a formation that happens to have a lot of hot water and in certain parts of North Texas could potentially hold the key to unlocking our geothermal potential. This is the Ellenberger Formation, for those of you who know it. And we still have work to do. We still need to drill a test well. We need to see if we let a rip how much water it can actually produce. But nonetheless, hey, the glove's been thrown, right? It's there. It's under our feet. In fact, it's about 10,000 feet below where, you, where you're all sitting right now. So um, just to give you an idea, some of our wells these days get down to 13,000 feet in this area. So we're not too far off. It's right under our feet. It's long term. It's sustainable. It helps keep, keeps jobs locally. It helps employ these oil and gas companies, hacking them, repurposing them to find greener solutions. So what can you do? Obviously, I cannot tell everything about geothermal in one talk. But what I can say is in times of peace, prepare for war. Natural gas won't be cheap forever. So learn more. There's plenty of resources online. We've got the SME Geothermal Lab here at your service. Get a passive system in your home. And if you're in the oil and gas industry, see me at lunch. <laughs> kind of want to drill a well. So I believe in a green energy future, and I believe that geothermal will help us get there. And remember, when it comes to green solutions, don't trash the box. Hack the cube. Thank you very much.